You know, when from the mid-90s to the first part of the 2000s, Robin and I lived in Navarre, Florida, which is about halfway between Gulf Breeze and Pensacola. So we were really part of the greater Pensacola community. We would spend as much time there uh, as we would going into Fort Walton. Of course, I uh, worked in Fort Walton with the Air Force Base, with the Air Force. Uh, but there was a, a phenomenon that happened during the time I was there. We were there from 93 to 03, and about 1995, and many of you may be familiar with it, may have heard of it, called the Brownsville Revival. It was a nationwide spectacle, if you will, um, and it lasted from around 95 to 2000 in our church uh, we lived about 15 miles as the crow flies from Pensacola. And similar revivals popped up in different areas of the U.S. and Canada. After some study of it and everything, it appeared that uh, there was some sort of manipulation uh, of the events. The uh, pastor had reportedly said that he would leave the church if it did not accept revival. It was said that a mighty wind blew through the church on a particular Sunday. The members that were there said that that did not happen. Now, this was reported in the Pensacola News Journal, um, investigative report afterwards. But it, but, but it was, again, it was nationwide. They, they figured that between two and a half to four million people came through to experience what was happening at Brownsville. They were singing. Okay, wonderful. There was dancing. No, we're Baptists, so we don't want to go there. But the altars would be packed with hundreds of writhing or dead still bodies. Some would stay there for hours. There were miraculous healings, but miraculous healings, but no records were kept. It was falling to the ground, shaking, sort of coming into a sort of a coma-like state. Elsewhere, in the similar revivals that are going on around the nation, and, and some of this may have happened at Brownsville as well, this, this phenomenon of being slain in the spirit. And you may have seen it through some televangelists and that's those sort of things where uh, the, the man at the podium would just wave his hand and just the crowd would fall back as though the Holy Spirit were something like a football that you could just pass and be manipulated. There was barking. People would break out in spontaneous, uncontrollable barking, uncontrollable laughter, walking aimlessly around for hours, just muttering unintelligible things. There was, it could be described as some sort of a religious ecstasy. An idea of being overpowered and overcome with the Holy Spirit that resembled something like a drunken fest. Actually, this type of religious ecstasy is more akin to pagan worship and cult like worship than it is biblical worship there's less of it lately but it often circles back around and it's been noted that when it does sometimes it's even more spectacular than it was the last time it came around and we were ministering during this time we were close to it but is that the real purpose is that an accurate description of what happened at Pentecost because what happened at Pentecost is often used as a defense for, for that kind of manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Is that what happened at Pentecost? We seem to always want more, though, don't we? And there is a wonderful non-complacency that says, Lord, I want more of you. I want to understand more of you. I want to, I want to know you. But so often we try to find things that appeal to the flesh. And I'm going to tell you, the flesh is never satisfied. That's why when this stuff comes around and goes back around and goes back around, it's usually uh, more 
spectacular than it is when it came the first time because the flesh wants more and more and more. As we go through this passage today, the first, the first sermon ever preached for the church, I want us to keep in mind some things and just keep in mind that the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus Christ. It will come progressively through the spread of the gospel, and that's where we're at right now, parked in the book of Acts, and it will come universally with the return of Christ. And we're going to see that progressive expression and expansion of the kingdom, and, and we're going to look at the proper expression of what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth that is far removed from some of the chaos and the spectacle uh, where the Holy Spirit is, is more of a side attraction and a sideshow than holy worship. We're going to see the disciples being witnesses in Jerusalem, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, the ends of the world. This is, this is the witness in Jerusalem uniquely and specifically is the first act of the church on that day of Pentecost. So if you, if you have chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it's a, a, a fairly long passage. If we'd stand to honor God's word, if you are able, as we read it. Acts chapter 2, beginning in, first, in verse 14 and going uh, through verse 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have, made me known, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he doth both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh be corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not descend into the, ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
For those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Heavenly Father, Lord, make this word alive in our hearts. Lord, may we uh, properly understand who you are, what you have done, the work of your Holy Spirit, God, the, your desires for this church, your desires for our lives as we are your witnesses, Father. God, we come to you with a desire to know you and to know you well. Lord, minister to us by your Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, you may have noted that we covered the entire sermon that Peter that was recorded in the book of Acts in about three minutes. And some of you may be hoping that Brother Kevin will learn from that and maybe get what he needs to say in about that amount of time. I would just simply remind you of verse 40, and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them. So I don't want to raise any false hopes this morning uh, that this is going to be as short as Peter's sermon. Uh, like most of the dialogues in Scripture and certain the sermons that we find in Acts and throughout, uh, Jesus' uh, Olivet Discourse is uh, on the, the Beatitudes on the Mount of Olives, uh, likely a summary of the highlights, but certainly not necessarily the entire thing that was spoken. But we come to this and we find, and I entitled this sermon, Pentecostal Preaching. You know, what happened on this particular day? And at this particular time, what would it have been like to be in the streets of Jerusalem and as we go back to the first part of the chapter, to hear the, the sound of a mighty rushing wind and, and then to hear these people talking and, and, and evidently and obviously full of joy and speaking in languages that can be understood by the people there, what, what would it have been like? And of course, we find Peter standing in verse 14. Of course, you know, this, this is a different Peter than the one we remember from the end of the Gospels, isn't it? The one who is afraid to, to speak of his association with Jesus Christ to, to a mere servant girl who would deny him three times and the, and the rooster would crow and then he'd, he'd go away weeping bitter tears because of his failure to be associated with the person of Jesus Christ. Here, we find that Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. This is a confident Peter. This is a Peter that has been changed and transformed by a resurrected Christ and the filling of the Holy Spirit. It is amazing what happens when we come into an acknowledgement and to the knowledge of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And when we come to that acknowledgement and we put our faith, hope, and trust in him, then the Holy Spirit indwells us and gives us courage where there used to be cowardice. And Peter standing before this crowd, and of course in this crowd, uh, we saw in verses 12 and 13, there are some who tried to make meaning out of what had happened, but there are some who were just, just happy to mock everything that was going on, to mock the things of God. But Peter stands up of confidence and asserting the truth to these people that he both knew and both, that he had been revealed to him and that now he, he was going to be sharing with a world that, that would be contrary to it but so many would accept it. He says, what you have seen, these people are not drunk as you suppose. Now, now let's, let's parse that out just a little bit. Let's, let's look at what that might mean. First of all, he said it was just the third hour of the day. That would be 9 o'clock. They would start the day at 6 a.m., 7, 8, 9. This was about 9 o'clock in the morning. But here's what this does not mean. Uh, we're not drunk now, but you come back a little bit later in the evening, boy, we'll show you how to throw a party. We'll show you how to paint the town red. This is not what that means at all, but the way some tra uh, uh, translate or the way some interpret this passage of Scripture, that's about what they would be Inferring. It does not mean that there was drunken debauchery. And as we mentioned, some have even called this being drunk in the spirit, hence the, the Brownsville, those kinds of things that, that are uh, a mockery to holiness in so many ways. Ephesians 5 tells us to not be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The two things are diametrically opposed 
actually. To be drunk with wine is to lose the faculties of my mind. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be precisely in your right mind. The Bible teaches throughout sober-mindedness. There's a, there's a principle that's called analogia scriptura, which means that, that the scripture interprets scripture and there are no contradictions. So when you're reading something in one spot, the rest of the scripture must not contradict what you're reading. And this would be totally contrary to what the scripture teaches of being of a sound mind. For denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Titus 2 tells us. The Bible teaches sober-mindedness and to be filled with the Spirit is to be precisely in the perfectly right frame of mind because my mind is aligned with the mind of God. And I've said this before, if you want to see what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like, no one was more filled with the Holy Spirit than Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity led by the Spirit in his life. God is not the God of disorder or chaos. He is the God of of order and so we might say that they just simply thought kind of like the phrase they're out of their mind surely the joy and those kind of things might bring to mind uh festive and that sort of thing but 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 these people are just out of their mind they don't know what they're saying what's going on here he says we're not drunk nobody generally speaking in the world is drunk at nine o'clock in the morning so that's definitely not the answer But it was the fulfillment of prophecy from some 600 to 900 years before. The, the time of the writing of Joel, uh, just not certain. Different estimates, good, solid scholars uh, disagree on exactly when it was written. But hundreds of years before, there was a prophecy that was foretold by the prophet Joel. And Peter turns to Scripture to explain what has happened. So this first point, Pentecostal preaching is spirit-filled and Bible-born. That is, Pentecostal preaching is preached by someone and I don't say this with any pride or anything, Lord help me, to be filled every day with your spirit, but Pentecostal preaching is preached by someone who is yielding their life to the Lord, yielding who they are to fulfill the will of God in their life. It's not to be how how slick we can be at the pulpit or how manipulative we can be with what we say. Was it spirit filled and is birthed out of Scripture, out of the Word of God? If I don't have a Bible to preach, I've got nothing to say. And so, of course, we realize that Peter is literally creating spirit. Scripture as he's talking. He was an apostle. The apostles had the authority of Scripture. They spoke with the authority of God. But throughout this sermon, we see Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 referred to as well as the prophet Joel in chapter 2 of Joel. Throughout the Acts, he appeals to Scripture and to prophecy. Proper preaching is born out of Scripture. We pull out what is there and we distill what it says. In verses 17 through 21, We see Joel's prophecy. He reads it to the people, or he he says it to the people. He's referring to it. And in the last days, it shall be. The last days in the Old Testament spoke of the coming of the Messiah. And when we look at, when we look at Old Testament prophecy and we see long-term prophecies there, the, the the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, oftentimes it is hard to see some of the details of the prophecy. For instance, 
in the coming of Messiah, we saw this in the lives of the disciples as they were continually asking, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But looking backwards, and we can see all through the Old Testament the references to the suffering servant, but the coming of Messiah would be in two phases. Him coming as a man, born uh, as, a, as a human, laid in a manger, living a sinless life, giving himself uh, for the redemption of mankind, and then at some other point he would come back again in power and glory. From the Old Testament perspective, it's like looking at a mountain scene. Looking at far off mountains, you see the outline, the silhouette of the mountains against the horizon, but as you come closer, you begin to see the ridges and other peaks that are smaller, and you're seeing the higher ones, and that's what's happening in the prophecy concerning Christ. And so this last days that the Old Testament speaks of is the coming of Messiah. They couldn't see the details, but the last days have actually been since Jesus came. We are still living in the last days. So when you see the last days referred to in Scripture, that's what it means, there's still the second part of the prophecy to be fulfilled. Now, there is obviously a partial fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, the, ref, the reference that he makes is to Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, and he, he mentions those, he reads it or quotes it here again, in verses 17 through 21. And we still look forward to the complete fulfillment of this prophecy because there's several things in here that we have certainly not seen yet. First of all, in verse 17 of Acts, and in the last days it shall be that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There's a day coming. This is uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and he's quoting Joel, that all flesh, obviously the spirit has not been poured out on all flesh. We look forward to that uh, perhaps in the millennial kingdom. The gift of prophecy is still going on uh, in the in the sense that not direct revelation of God and foretelling the future but the proclamation of the word of God aspects of that still goes on in verses 19 and 20 and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. The day of the Lord is referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ when he will not come as a suffering, suffering servant, but as righteous and conquering king. And he will judge the world. If you listen to our Tuesday and Thursday morning live streams, we're going through the book of Revelation and, and that is where we're at. The day of the Lord is God's judgment and the return of Jesus Christ. So those certainly have not yet been fulfilled. In verse 33 of chapter 2 here, we do see, and we'll get to it in a moment, that he has poured out this. That is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the aspect of the prophecy of Joel, and the pouring out of the Spirit is what's happening right before the very eyes of the people in Jerusalem. Verse 21, the Spirit has come the witness is going out and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the predisposition of God to a whosoever will gospel and also speaks of the sovereignty of God. And we don't try to make those two things in our own mind mesh and coincide. They're two mysteries of God, but this speaks of both the, the, the outgoing call of the gospel and the sovereignty of God So this sermon that is spirit-filled and Bible-born, we see that the message of it is gospel-driven. The second point, Pentecostal preaching is Christ-centered and gospel-driven, verses 30, 30, 22 through 36. Now in this particular passage, well in the whole passage total, Jesus is referred to some 27 times. 27 times in some way or another, whether it's Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ, Lord, Him, He, Holy One, some 27 times Jesus Christ is referred to. The Father referred to about uh, 14 times. The Holy Spirit referred to three times. Now, the Holy Spirit is not unimportant here. The Holy Spirit is, is, is the force, uh, is empowering everything that goes on. But when the emphasis, 
in church or the emphasis in worship is on the Holy Spirit, not on Jesus Christ, the worship is out of order. The emphasis at Pentecost, the emphasis in the book of Acts is not the Holy Spirit. The emphasis in the book of Acts is Jesus and his gospel. That is the emphasis throughout and how the disciples, how the men men and women of the first century church were witnesses to that gospel. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit does not speak of himself and magnifies Jesus Christ. So if your emphasis is on the Holy Spirit or some manifestation of the Holy Spirit, if that is the emphasis, your worship is out of order. It pleases God to give Jesus Christ the preeminence in the church and in our worship. We love and praise the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity, but Jesus is preeminent. Verses 22 through 24 then, we find here right at the outset as he gets past the preparatory, as he gets past the, the, the uh, prophecy of Joel, and he'll come back to that, that is his text, we see the gospel front and center in the preaching. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, Christ-centered, gospel-driven. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by. Pentecostal preaching is Christ-centered and gospel-driven Verses 22 through 24. What is the gospel that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture? So the gospel right here at the very beginning, the purpose, you will be my witnesses. You will share my word. You will share who I am with all of those who come within your hearing and I will minister by my Holy Spirit to make it alive in their life and many will come to me. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is a call that goes out that is gospel driven. What we do in this church is gospel driven. What is our witness What is our purpose? To to be witnesses of God, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And we glorify him by exalting his son and preaching and teaching his gospel. The driving force behind everything that we do. This man, verse 22, attested to you by God with mighty works, the miracles that he did, the wonders that they had seen. It was not done in a closet. It was not done on the backside of nowhere. It was done right in their midst throughout the region of Palestine. Jesus walking among his people, doing the works and wonders and signs of God. They knew who he was. And then verses 22 through 24, or verses uh, 25 through 28, we see another prophecy. This time the prophecy of David as Peter again goes to Scripture, he's, he's quoting Psalm 16, 8 through 11. In verse 25, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand. I might not be shaken, therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. You will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. David had died, and David was in the grave. Jesus had died, but there ain't no grave. Where is he? This is a prophecy of Jesus' resurrection. You know, the story is told of Joseph Stalin, the former leader of communist Russia. When he died, they... They took and they embalmed his body. They laid it in state. And then they had the idea, well, we're, going to preserve, we're going to preserve his body for eternity. So they took weeks to do the things necessary to preserve his body. And then they put it in Lenin's uh, tomb in his museum. And they had a, a glass encasing around it, a sarcophagus. And, and, and people would come by and they would see uh, this great man. And, and as he lay in state, of course, then after a few years, they realized how the atrocities that he had done and, and the, the truth of all the things that happened under him. So, so now that man 
His body is laying in a simple grave with a simple epithet. Not revered by any. They may have prepared his body for eternity, but it is decaying. It is continuing to decompose. There is no grave. There is no mark. There is no place that says, here lies Jesus Christ, AD 0 to AD 33. There is no place we go to worship a dead leader. But we go to the throne of grace to worship a risen Savior. And this is what Peter and the disciples are attesting to. In verses 29 through 36, we see the power and the glory. This is Christ-centered, gospel-driven preaching that Peter is doing on the day of Pentecost. He says, brother, I say to you, may I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. This passage of scripture is not speaking about David. This passage of scripture is a prophecy of the person of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And there is a resurrection power whereby Jesus is alive and there are witnesses to that power and there are partakers of that power through the Holy Spirit. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we all are witnesses. That's that fourth leg of the gospel, if you will. 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was dead and buried, that he was dead and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen by many. Again, didn't happen in a closet. This happened for everyone to see, and Jesus walked and moved among those who were his followers, and they bore witness to the point of death, most of them, that they had seen the risen Savior. They were proclaiming what they knew. And then in verses 33, we see the glory of God being therefore exalted. Verse 33, therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, Quoting Psalm 110.1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The Lord Jesus Christ is in his glory. Being glorified from the grave, overcoming death, hell and the grave seated at the right hand of God that place of prominence that place of power exalted Christ on display we raise him up for others to see and others to hear this then Peter gets back to Joel Verse 33, he speaks of the Holy Spirit being poured out at you yourselves. This is what you yourselves are seeing and hearing. That Christ who made possible everything that is happening today is because he has received the gift from the Father and now he is pouring it out upon us. So he is now conquering king is Lord Christ. So we preach Christ. We magnify the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, crucified and died for our sins, dead and buried, paying the penalty, risen again the third day in accordance with the scriptures, exalted, magnified, glorified. We preach Jesus Christ who alone can save. We preach him who alone can keep. So Pentecostal preaching is spirit-filled and Bible-born. It is Christ-centered and gospel-driven, and it is heart-convicting and life-transforming, verses 37 through 41. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That is the question, isn't it? When we are confronted with the gospel, when we are confronted with our own sins, you crucified Christ. 
Peter told the crowd, friends, we are just as guilty. We are just as much co-conspirators with everything that happened to Christ as he died on our behalf, guilty. And the message of Christ, the gospel of Christ comes as it convicts our heart over the sinfulness that, that we uh, have before the Lord of glory. That, that we fall short of all that God has expected and all that God desires. And the fact that sin breaks our heart, not simply because of consequences, but because sin itself is so contrary to who God is, it is contrary to what we desire in our lives. Cut to the heart. That is true conviction. This idea of cut is a, is a word that's used of, of stabbing and, and it, is, it is used for piercing and sudden and all of a sudden, so the people heard this message, they realized they were confronted with the fact that they had killed their Messiah. You can't, you can't overstate what that means. All of the hope of Israel was wrapped up in this Messiah and he had been rejected and now they're confronted with the reality that they had actually killed the one God had come, uh, one had sent to them to free them. They killed their Messiah. What shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the, forgiveness of, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent is a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of purpose. Uh, we've illustrated here by walking one way and making 180 degree. We're walking with the way of the world and then we turn and now we're walking in the way of God. It is a fundamental transformation of who we are. And this is the only time this particular phrase is used in this order, and it's been confusing to many people throughout church history. I, I don't know about many people, but, but it has been misinterpreted by some, and, and entire strains of, of Christian thought has gone off on this to repent and be baptized. That is baptism required for regeneration? Is baptism required for salvation? The fact is that this word for repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It can mean for the purpose of, but it can also mean because of or on occasion of. As, uh, and many of the translations, the ESV does not, many of the translations have a comma there. Repent, comma, and be baptized, almost as a, a separate thought, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, they go back to that idea, analogia scriptura, this idea that, the, that we must not contradict what Scripture says. The entire witness of Scripture, except for this right here, point, well, it, this does too. The entire witness of Scripture shows that faith in Christ alone is the, the basis for salvation. In fact, in other places of Scripture, Acts 10, 47, we see that people receive the Holy Spirit prior to baptism. And we also realize that this is a, this is a church in transition a, uh, as, as, as we're moving to getting the, the doctrine and everything settled, but, but there's no problem, there's no contradiction in this passage of Scripture. The fact is that in the early church, baptism was so associated with salvation, it was done quickly and it was, and, and it was done formally and openly. And that might not mean so much to us today. So a lot of times we, we wait for, for uh, parents, grandparents to come and so they can take part in that celebration. But for us, what does it really cost? It doesn't cost us virtually anything. Cost. But in this day, you could pretty much profess what you wanted, but the moment you, the moment you accepted baptism, the moment you made the public display of your faith, and this is this way in the Middle East and in many other places around the world, the moment you make a public profession and you are publicly identify with Jesus Christ, that's when the trouble begins. And this was very much like Jesus telling the rich young ruler to, take, to just to sell everything he has and come follow me. This is not easy believism. This is, this is getting to the heart of the matter. Has the Holy Spirit convicted your life? Has he convicted your heart of the sin in your life? And are you willing to drop all and follow Jesus Christ to be associated and identified with him? 
This was a complete change of life for these people, a complete separation from the life that they had known before to place their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus. And so we come to this to repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. This is a call for all to separate from this perverse generation. That word perverse, escolios, means crooked. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So the message goes out. Gospel-driven message that is heart-convicting and life-transforming. What about you? Pentecostal preaching resulted in 3,000 souls added to the church. As we think about this passage, as we think about the implications, as we think about what the Lord is calling us to do in our own lives, this was the presentation of the gospel. In the day of Pentecost, which stands unique in all of history, the birthday of the church, the presentation of the gospel by the church, 3,000 changed and transformed lives that joined those that had already given their hearts and lives to Christ. This was a God-honoring, holy day. And God calls his church. God calls his people to be yielded to the sway of into the way of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He calls those who are not saved. He, he presents you with the gospel. He presents you with life. Would you be like the ones who would say, what shall we do? Are you, are you, are you a part of this church? Is there added that day about 3,000 souls? I'm not talking about are you a member of Woodland Baptist Church, although that is an important question too. What I am asking is, are you part of this church? The gospel of Jesus Christ applied to your life. Are you ready to follow him? be publicly identified with him you've you've been baptized how about publicly identified where you live where you work where you play be a witness for Jesus I don't know what the Lord has laid on your heart you like to find meaning in what has been preached here today or would you prefer to mock We ask, what must we do with what the Lord has spoken through his word this morning? You pray, and then I'll close us. Would you have your way in our life? Would you have your way in this church? Lord, would you continue to conform us into the image of your Son? We transform our minds. Lord, with the word, 
we renew our minds, God, through going close to who you are. To give the Holy Spirit his way in our life. Father, I pray that in some way or through the foolishness of preaching that these words today would weigh on our hearts. Lord, to cleanse Lord, every corner and crevice of our lives that would be open to you and that we would be completely yielded and surrendered. Lord, we love you. Praise you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.